Welcome to the Walker Experience. I am Devin Walker. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I have a great show lined up for us for today. Um, former Baltimore City Mayor and current University of Baltimore President Kirk Smoke will be giving me a call in probably approximately the next five minutes. So please stay tuned, and I hope that you enjoy the interview. Here we go. Hello. 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 Hi, Mr. Walker. Yes. Uh, it's Kurt Schmoe. Hey, how you doing, sir? All right, just uh, following up on your email. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I wanted to do a um, just a quick interview with you. Um, I'm I'm a student at Morgan State University, and on one of my assignments in my profile and biography writing class was to uh, find someone to write a profile on. And I chose you. <laughs> goodness. <laughs> so, uh, good morning, though. How are you feeling today? Uh, I'm doing okay. Uh, how about you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. And uh, how are you and your family holding up with uh, COVID? Yeah, we're doing okay. Everybody's got vaccinated, so we're in good shape. Oh, that's great. That's great. So, um, well, before we get started, I just want to thank you for allowing me your time today. Um, you have been an inspiration to me, and I am forever grateful for your dedication to public service. Appreciate it. All right. Um, so, yeah, I was sitting in, on February 1st, I was sitting in my profile and biography class, and I was thinking about the perfect person to write a profile on. And while I was sitting in class, I received a news alert on my phone, which said that the uh, state of Oregon had moved to become the first state to decriminalize the possession of drugs. And right away I thought about you and your desire to do the same in the 80s. And I was just wondering how you must have felt about um, how, how that made you feel. You know, was it in a I told you so moment or uh, were you, did it bother you that uh, something that you suggested nearly 40 years ago was being suddenly embraced today? Well, I was uh, pleased to read that news uh, I recognize that the political environment has changed dramatically from the time that I first raised it until now. Right. So um, back in the 1980s, most people thought we could arrest and prosecute our way out of the drug problem. Um, and that's why by 1990, they were the public was pushing for tougher drug laws, longer sentences, mandatory minimums. Um, and I, it's just taken a while for uh, people to recognize, uh, particularly um, uh, politicians, to recognize that um, the war on drugs should be more of a public health war rather than a criminal justice war. Right, right. Okay. Um, so you have been quoted in saying that universities are to serve as anchors to the community because if the community declines, so does the university. And so um, I'm wondering what policies or programs has you be implemented that would address the blight, food deserts, and the abundance of liquor stores that plague the inner city? Well, we have many. I'll just give you a couple of examples. Okay. In our College of Public Affairs, we have a, a program called the Community Development Fellowship Program. And there we uh, train students who are interested in working with uh, nonprofit organizations that are community based. And okay. Many times those uh, organizations don't have enough staff to. Uh, reach their goals. So we provide them with uh, staff through this fellowship uh, program. So the organization benefits and then our students benefit because they get real world uh, experience and they help out a, a, a community based organization. That's just one. Um, we have, we operate a, um, branch of the university 
in the Jessup Correctional Institution, where we um, have 58 students. Uh, these are men who are within two years of their release, and um, they will continue <clears throat> their education at the university once they are released. But it means that as returning citizens, they're coming back better prepared right. for jobs than if our program didn't exist. Um, we also have a, a, a similar a program, but it's not in the institution. It's uh, for women who are recently released. It's called Alternative Direction. And um, uh, one of our professors runs this, and it helps women with uh, uh, ed both education and counseling and uh, career training. Uh, these are pe women on probation. Uh, or parole. Oh wow! Um, and then, of, of course, at the, the business school, we train a lot of young entrepreneurs. So we it, it's a wide variety of programs um, that we're involved with. We we view the university as being an anchor institution in the city. So we uh, we believe that we're nerd, uh, training leaders. Uh, uh, for now and for the future of Baltimore. Oh, wow. Right. Yeah, so that was actually my next question was going to be about the, uh, the second chance program, which allowed incarcerated individuals at uh, Jessup to receive Pell grants to pursue secondary education. Um, but can you speak on the, the success rate? Yeah, well, it, the, our program started under president Obama where uh, President Obama selected 60, uh, I think it was 64 universities around the country right. to participate in this program. Uh, it's been so successful that now the uh, Congress has agreed to extend the um, uh, uh, Pell Grant eligibility for uh, in incarcerated individuals. And... Um, we, we have uh, uh, currently, uh, as I said, 58 men uh, in the program, and uh, 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 we've had uh, some uh, already released and who have come back to the university and uh, are in the process of completing their degree. Right, okay. Now, um, you once wrote that other than your parents, education has been the most significant, has, has had the most significant impact on your achievements. And uh, when you were mayor, you ran on an education platform. However, uh, a lot of public schools in Baltimore are underperforming and they lack significant resources. Like they, uh, right. they lack heat when they are in the wintertime or air conditioning in warmer days. So I was just wondering, how do we fix this problem? Well, there has to be a review of the existing spending uh, before the city would be successful in getting more money because too many critics say that we're not spending the money properly. Um, so the, uh, a top-to-bottom review of all uh, spending in uh, the school system is necessary and uh, after that, then a campaign um, must occur to get additional resources, not only from government, but from the private sector. Because the private sector, the business community, uh, has uh, much to gain by having a well-educated workforce. Right. So it would be to their benefit to invest in some of the areas um, uh, uh, that uh, the school system currently is coming up short. Okay. Now, I understand that you are in favor of a merger of Baltimore City Community College, Coppin State University, and the University of Baltimore. Uh, what would be the terms of the merger, and how will the universities maintain their identity? Uh, Mr. Walker, can I just correct you that the, the I, I've never used the term merger, um, and what I said is uh, it would be a, 
a collaboration. It, it, the idea is to create in Baltimore a system that is similar to the City University of New York. Right. And there they have uh, uh, a large number of, of institutions, both two-year community college, the four-year, and some graduate programs that are all under one uh, umbrella, uh, but they retain their distinct identity. For example, there is a Malcolm X College, there's a City College of New York, there's a, um, a, a Lehman College, there's a Bronx College. So, uh, but what that's a, simply a, a way of saying it is basically a um, it, 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 it's a, a, a collaborative partnership that where the benefits would really be on uh, financial in terms of the non-academic side uh, savings on uh, uh, procurement, uh, um, uh, information technology, um, all the um, uh, uh, expenses that are non-academic uh, could be centralized with the community college, Coppin, and uh, the University of Baltimore um, in a in a collaboration. So it uh, it would not merge the them out of existence in, in terms of um, having uh, you know a, a distinct identity, but they would be under. I, I would say a similar administrative umbrella. That that's the best way of saying right, okay. it. It would be uh, for uh, all the non-academic purposes. Um, uh, a a uh, an, effect, a, an effective administrative model. Oh. In my view, that's my view. Okay. <laughs> so, um, but where well, where are we in that process? Is, is it? Likely to happen? No, um, because Hoppin, it, uh, well, the, the, they they are part of a lawsuit, right? That is, um, you know, in its thirteenth year now, and it is unlikely that any major reorganization will occur until that lawsuit is resolved. Right, right. So that that um, would also affect a possible collaboration with the University of Baltimore and Morgan State? Well, Morgan was not interested mainly because uh, Morgan is, is not a part of the university system of Maryland. They like uh, to be independent of the university system, right. whereas University of Baltimore and Coppin are a part of the university uh, system. And although the community college is outside. Uh, there is uh, some interest in exploring this idea of a city university of Baltimore by the leadership at the at uh, BCCC because the president there uh, was uh, an administrator in Georgia in Atlanta when there was a merger, an actual merger of. Um, Georgia State University and Perimeter Community College. Right. That's led to some real benefits down there, and um, so that that that's another uh, I don't know model that you could look at. But that was a complete merger um, to create an, an institution called Georgia Perimeter. Right. right. Okay. okay. Uh, so, what are your thoughts on the the HBCU lawsuit? Well, I'm glad that the speaker, Adrian Jones, has taken the leadership in drafting legislation that could possibly settle the lawsuit. It's been dragging on too long. But uh, she has introduced House Bill 1, and uh, State Senator uh, Ferguson has introduced a similar bill on the Senate side uh, that <clears throat> uh, the lawsuit... The, the, the plaintiffs in the lawsuit uh, seem to like this legislation. It passed, as you know, the uh, last session, but the governor vetoed it. So they've rewritten it, and uh, if it passes this time and they override the governor's veto, then a condition of the legislation is that they settle the lawsuit. And uh, 
the bottom line is that it would bring to the four institutions a little over $577 million right. over the next few years. And I think that that will um, uh, uh, help to, to resolve uh, the issues that were brought up in the case. Wow. All right. So um, in doing my research, though, I, I learned that you announced a desire to be mayor at, at eight years old. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then I also learned that you were present at the March on Washington as a teenager. Yeah. Um, so can you share uh, any a little known story about your personal life? Well, what happened on that, that eight year old business is that uh, I was downtown with my mother one day and we happened to, we were standing on the corner and the gentleman who was standing right next to me was uh or Theodore McKeldin, who was uh, then uh, the mayor. And I looked up at him and I said, Mom, you know, there's Mayor McKeldin. And he reached down, shook my hand. She was just surprised that I knew who he was. <laughs> and he was old. And then I told her, yeah, you know, I'd like to be mayor one day. So that, that's how that came, that came about. Uh, March on Washington, uh, it was August 1963. It was my mother's, again, desire to go to that. She was the one that uh, had the idea. And she, she wanted to go to participate in the march and to hear a speaker. And it wasn't Dr. King. It was uh, Benjamin Mays, who oh, was then okay. uh, the, the former president of uh, Morehouse College. My mother had attended Spelman, and uh, Mays was... Uh, kind of a, a legendary figure in the Atlanta University system. And uh, so we there uh, went there to hear Dr. Mays, and of course we were uh, um, all inspired by what we heard from not only him, but Dr. King and others. Oh, wow, yeah. And uh, your, your mother was a social worker? She was, right. Yeah, was, my, my mom was a social worker. My mom uh, has been a social worker for about 35 years now. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, so do you have any final thoughts or comments you'd like to share? Um, well, I hope you get an A. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope so, too. I hope so, too. Because the next project is um, a neighborhood profile and then a business profile. So I'm oh. going to try to find a way to merge the three of them. But, but yeah, uh, I hope so, too. <laughs> uh, well, th- in, in, in terms of... Uh, Neighborhood and business profile, though, I mean, one of the things that I did, I was able to do while I was mayor, um, you know, Baltimore competed and we got we designated as an empowerment zone uh, city. And that brought additional resources that we could uh, invest. And uh, uh, so we did in, in three different areas. Um, and uh, it showed, you know, Im- improvement in um, I- extending uh, 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 business efforts in the inner and in going in Harbor East um, in West Baltimore near the University of Maryland Hospital. Um, and I guess the third area was in South Baltimore. Uh, but uh, the other thing that, that we, we did, though, um, uh, we... Uh, invested and got from the federal government uh, uh, money for um, uh, uh, to to imp- uh, tear down the public housing high rises right. and rebuild uh, uh, nice neighborhoods. So um, uh, over in the east, I mean, well, it's well, I guess the east and west uh, Baltimore. Ple- what what's now Pleasant View Gardens? Uh, I say this only because there's a connection there between me and business development and community, and that would be one of uh, the use of, uh, of money, federal and public, private money, right. to uh, 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 change the uh, character of public housing uh, in Baltimore. And Pleasant View Gardens is the prime example of that which, you know, is over there off of Orleans Street. Right. So you did, it went from being a high-rise uh, kind of warehouse of poverty to now, you know, a nice neighborhood uh, with um, 
uh, community development, business development, public safety, um, all in, involved in that. So that that if that you might if you're trying to tie in all of these, uh, uh, you know, myself and community development and business development. Yeah, that, that sounds like the plan. <laughs> I think that's what I'm I'm going to do. But um, all right. Well, thank you for your time. I, I I really appreciate you giving me your time today. All all the best. What is the degree you're seeking? It's a uh, a master's in journalism. Oh, okay, great. All the best. Well, well, are you working with Dwayne Wickham? I'm not familiar with Dwayne Wickham. He's a dean at the School of Journalism. No, the only person I'm, I'm familiar with is uh, Jackie Jones. I haven't I haven't met Dwayne Wickham yet. Okay, well, he he may have I don't know maybe he was the founding dean. I, I, I it just dawned on me he may he may have uh, moved on, but uh, he was the uh, uh, founding dean of the journalism school there. Any of that? Okay, all the best to you. you. Take care. All right, thank you. You do the same. Bye. Wow, that was intense. That was uh, I've never been nervous on an interview before. <laughs> But um, first time for everything, I guess. So uh, I really hope that everyone enjoyed the interview. I hope that you found the information useful. And please like and subscribe and review the uh, podcast. We'll talk to you later.